The 2024 Paris Olympics start this week. TV audiences are expected to reach 3 billion people, making it a huge advertising opportunity for many partners. Toyota, a major sponsor of the Olympics for the last 10 years, has made an interesting choice for the official Olympic car. Let's discuss that choice today. Due to the size of the TV audiences, the Olympics is a big advertising opportunity. It will not be uncommon for partners to have big marketing programs and make strategic decisions about their involvement, choosing to promote their wares however possible. Toyota has been the global mobility partner for the Olympics since 2015, and this represents a huge opportunity for them to make a pitch to the billions watching about their electrification strategy. What is interesting about this year's games is the mix of vehicles making up the fleet helping to move officials around Paris. As you can imagine, the organisers of the Olympics want to promote sustainability of the games, and Toyota wants to be seen to be playing their part by promoting how sustainable their cars are. And up pops an interesting word, electrification. Toyota has been using the word electrified in their marketing for some years. Unfortunately, they want to claim that all of their cars are electrified, which is a bit unfortunate, as calling an ICE car electrified is perhaps slightly misleading. It's perhaps not the most honest of marketing strategies to say that a hybrid is electrified. In fact, Toyota have been very vocal opponents of EVs for years, a position which continues to this day, and have instead consistently pushed an agenda of hydrogen as their vision of the future. This has continued into the Olympics, where their fleet will contain some BEVs and plenty of hybrids, but just under 20% of the fleet that they are supplying is the Mirai, their hydrogen fuel cell saloon. Toyota has released a number of statements to the press about their use of the Mirai, and have even designed a separate livery for them so that they stand out from all the other vehicles in use. They sure are keen to continue down this path. That's understandable, of course, as they've been investing heavily in hydrogen fuel cell technology for well over a decade at this point, keen to get ahead in the race to a cleaner future, which is a great plan, but only as long as you're backing the right horse. And that's the problem, really. In the early days of EVs, the very high cost of lithium-ion batteries and their low energy density resulted in cars with a very limited range. Couple that with slow charging and it could easily appear that EVs had a very bleak future. They were going to be of use in only very few scenarios, for example as second cars. In contrast, hydrogen is abundant in the universe, leading to a hope that it could be obtained cheaply. And as a gas, it can be moved from one place to another very quickly, allowing for rapid refills. Whilst fuel cells were very expensive, the hope was that they would become cheaper over time. Neither battery nor fuel cell EVs were perfect in those early days. Both were going to need to improve to become viable alternatives to internal combustion, and manufacturers would need to invest significantly to make either a reality. Unfortunately, hydrogen's limitations would prove to be more problematic. Because it's a gas, hydrogen's energy density per unit volume is very low, resulting in a need to store it at a very high pressure to get enough energy on board a car. Tanks capable of holding sufficient pressure are not easy to fit into a car, causing the internal space to be a bit compromised in any hydrogen fuel cell car. But perhaps most tellingly, the efficiency of the processes involved have not improved like they'd hoped. Generating green hydrogen is done using electrolysis, and even today the most efficient electrolyzers are only about 65% efficient. Couple that with the efficiency of a fuel cell at just over 50%, plus the energy needed to compress and chill the gas and transport it to filling stations, and the overall system efficiency drops to below 30%. Whilst that's around about the same as most ICE cars, it's not close to the 75 to 85% achieved by a battery electric car. 
That's not just an esoteric technical difference. This results in needing to put about three times as much energy into a hydrogen car as to a battery electric vehicle. And that means the cost per mile will similarly be three times the cost of an EV, if not more. And consumers are going to balk at that big a difference. What does the consumer get for that money? At the moment, there are a few perceived benefits to a fuel cell car. The first is range. Fuel cell vehicles generally offer about 300 to 400 miles per fill, but a lot of battery EVs can do 200 to 300 miles without much trouble. The fuel cell wins there for sure, especially in the winter, as a fuel cell vehicle's range isn't really impacted by cold weather as we see with BEVs, but the range difference isn't as big as you might think. The next difference is in refueling time. A refill of hydrogen only takes about five minutes or so, whereas an EV is going to need more like half an hour for a decent top up. Having said that, what you do with an EV is recharge it while you take a break from driving. You can plug it in and walk away. In contrast, a hydrogen charge is fast enough that you are really forced to wait for it to finish so as to get off the pump and let someone else use it as fast as possible. Sometimes a faster refuel can be less convenient, not more convenient. And what is more, filling a hydrogen car can only be done at a refueling station, whereas many people can recharge an EV at home, in one of the many periods when it's not being used. Fuel cell cars are lighter, often by about 300 kilograms, so that's an advantage over battery EV. Having said that, a BEV is designed to carry its extra weight, using tyres designed to cope with the difference, for example. Furthermore, the battery pack in an EV is low down, and so the car doesn't necessarily handle a lot worse if it's well set up. There is an advantage here for hydrogen cars, but again, perhaps not all that big an advantage. Finally, longevity is a concern that people have for the traction batteries in battery electric vehicles. Generally, this is not proving to be a problem though. EV batteries are outlasting the eight year warranty period by a significant margin, and failures are rare even as cars start to reach 12 years old or more. What is more, the tanks in hydrogen cars need careful inspections to ensure that they remain safe at the high pressures at which they store gas. And even if they pass those inspections, must be replaced after no more than 15 years at some significant cost. There are some benefits to fuel cell cars then, but they are quite small. And are people really going to pay three times as much per mile for those benefits? I'm not sure they will, especially if battery technology improves a bit more and the gap narrows even further. Infrastructure was always going to be difficult for either solution. Whilst we have built a huge amount of today's infrastructure for ICE cars, that was done without competition largely, whereas going up against an existing market for the next generation technology is much more of a challenge. However, electricity is widespread in our modern environment. Whilst it needs some upgrades and enhancements, that's going to be easier than starting from scratch with a public hydrogen infrastructure. Companies gave it a bit of a go though. Hydrogen filling stations were installed in some places but the cost of using them was very high, and the cost of keeping them refuelled was probably also high. The low energy density of hydrogen means that each delivery truck contains far fewer refills than is the case for petrol or diesel. That means having to run more trucks. At least anecdotally, it seems that hydrogen filling stations are now on the decline. It certainly seems like more hydrogen stations are being closed than are being opened, in the West at least with Shell's exit from the California hydrogen refuelling market being just one example. No matter what our beliefs, at some point we need to take a step back and do a reality check. We need to ask ourselves whether our current approach is working to make sure we're not heading down a path that is narrowing and might become unpassable. Instinctively, hydrogen seems attractive. It feels familiar to what we know and superficially at least, seems a sound alternative to fossil fuels. 
But when we look at the detail, we see it to be far more problematic than we might have imagined. The volumetric energy density of hydrogen has some downsides. We need storage tanks that are quite bulky and difficult to fit into a car. And we need a huge increase in tankers to deliver it to filling stations. Because of the limits in the conversion efficiencies that have been encountered, we also need a lot of energy input to account for the losses in the total system, making it more expensive than we might have hoped. Hydrogen could have worked. In the early days, hydrogen fuel cell cars seemed to overcome some of the limitations of battery electric vehicles. But as the technology has progressed, the BEV has become the dominant player in green personal transport. Toyota, unfortunately, backed the wrong horse. In everywhere other than Japan, which does have some unusual market forces that might make fuel cell cars a bit more attractive, hydrogen passenger cars are a failed experiment. Given that, you have to wonder if promoting the fuel cell vehicle at the Olympics is a good idea. Isn't that rather squandering the marketing opportunity available to them as a partner? Perhaps it might be time for Toyota to reassess. And it seems owners might agree. On the 10th of July 2024, a class action lawsuit was filed in California claiming false representation by a Toyota on the ease of living with a fuel cell vehicle. A suit being filed is not the same as it being upheld. We don't yet know what the outcome of this suit will be. Personally, I'm not convinced that Toyota will be held accountable for someone else's fueling network, a problem they carefully sidestepped. But it certainly seems to suggest that those people who bought into Toyota's hopes for hydrogen might be starting to regret doing so. In summary, the hydrogen fuel cell might seem like a good solution to personal transportation. But look beneath the surface and the problems with the technology start to rear their heads. In reality, hydrogen is about solving a problem that doesn't really exist with BEVs, that recharging them is too slow. A modern EV suffers less from the problems of old. If you can, you will recharge a battery electric vehicle at home the vast majority of the time. And as they now have a lot of range, rapid charging is only necessary on very long trips. On those long trips, you will need to refuel yourself as well as the car, making the recharge time a bit less important than you might imagine at first. EVs are not perfect, but they are not the problem you might imagine before you try one. Thanks very much for joining me. Your questions and comments on this subject are most welcome. Are you waiting for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles? If you are, I fear you might have a long wait. If you've liked the video, then it's a help to me if you click the thumbs up button. And it would also help me achieve my stretch goal for the channel if you would subscribe as well. Thanks.